The key question is, why did Piedmont become so central to the unification process? In 1720, the Dukes of Savoy, who ruled over the then poor and backward state of Piedmont in northwest Italy, became kings of the island of Sardinia. Piedmont and Sardinia together came to be known as the Kingdom of Sardinia or Sardinia Piedmont, but most usually just Piedmont. At the end of the 18th century, Piedmont had only a small population, most of whom were peasants. Although a large number of children were born, the death rate was very high and life expectancy was short. The number of people living in the capital, Turin, was declining. There was little or no industry and the countryside was poverty stricken. Nevertheless, Piedmont had two advantages over neighboring states. Unlike the other states, it had a very strong army. It was also well governed by an absolute monarch. The king, as head of state, made all decisions and all the laws, decided what taxes should be levied and what they should be spent on, and appointed government ministers. He alone could declare war or make peace. There was no parliament, and so the people had no share in government, no votes, and no say in what happened. At the end of the 18th century, Piedmont made an alliance with Austria. The Piedmontese royal family was closely connected by marriage with the French royal family, and this made them automatically an enemy of the French Republic, which had deposed and executed Louis XVI, and then of Napoleon. In 1792, when the French army attacked Nice and Savoy to the west of Piedmont, Austria and Piedmont declared war on France. The war went badly for the Allies with the result that during 1799 and again from 1802 to 1814, Piedmont was united with France. This meant that Piedmont came into very close contact with French law and French government organizations. Piedmontese schools became part of the French education system. Piedmont's young men were conscripted into the French army, and French became the language of polite society as well as of government, and the well-to-do members of society became more and more French in outlook. There was no great opposition to French rule, and the middle classes even found it to their advantage as it provided career opportunities. In government service and in the army, they were allowed to fill posts previously reserved only for members of the nobility. Only towards the end of French occupation was there unrest and dissatisfaction with young men setting up anti-French secret societies. In 1815, the King of Piedmont, Victor Emmanuel I, who had been in exile in Sardinia during the Napoleonic Wars, returned to Turin as one of the restored monarchs. To make himself more welcome, he abolished conscription and reduced taxation, but on his minister's advice, he announced that Piedmont was still bound by the laws made before 1800, which many considered out of date, and that these could not now be changed. Piedmont became once again an absolute monarchy. The French legal system, the Code Napoleon, was abolished along with equal justice for all. Criminal trials were no longer open or fair, the only good thing being that torture was not reintroduced. In 1819, just as local and central government were being modernized in Piedmont, alarms about the possibility of revolution led to modernization being brought to a sudden end. Membership of revolutionary secret societies was growing at this time, and some moderate Piedmontese hoped that this would encourage the king to introduce political and other reforms. They were disappointed but not surprised, knowing that there was little chance of action by Victor Emmanuel I or his brother and heir, Charles Felix. They pinned their hopes instead on the second in line to the throne, Charles Albert. On his return to Piedmont from exile in France, where he had lived since his father died when he was only two years old, Charles Albert saw just how severe and oppressive Piedmont's government had become. 
He showed sympathy with revolutionary students injured in the riots in Turin and was known to have connections with revolutionary officers in the army. In March of 1821, the liberals appealed to him to lead a revolution. Initially, he agreed, but soon he changed his mind. While he was dithering, a revolutionary group seized the fortress of Alexandria in Genoa and established a provincial government calling itself the Kingdom of Italy and, rather foolishly, declared war on Austria. At this stage, the 62-year-old Victor Emmanuel I, tired of being pressured by revolutionary groups to grant political and social reforms, and worried by reports of new army mutinies in Turin, decided to abdicate. He left for Nice, close to the western frontier of Piedmont, as revolution spread throughout his kingdom. His heir and younger brother, Charles Felix, was away from Piedmont, and so Charles Albert seized the initiative and set up a new government and granted a new constitution. But when Charles Felix denounced him as a fraud, Charles Albert fled, and the legitimate monarch gained control of Piedmont with the aid of Austrian forces. He promptly revoked the new constitution. Only in 1831, when Charles Felix died, did Charles Albert become at last King of Piedmont. The new king's early career had been marked by contradictions, and the same pattern now reasserted itself so that it is very difficult for historians to interpret his real aims. On the one hand, Charles Albert could give the impression of being an old-fashioned ruler. It seemed that he would be as absolute and oppressive as a monarch as Victor Emmanuel I or Charles Felix. He began his reign by signing a treaty with Austria and threatening to attack the liberal government then in power in France. He refused to pardon the political prisoners left over from the 1821 revolutions. He increased the power of the church in Piedmont, and he tightened the already severe censorship laws. Small wonder, then, that Mazzini and Garibaldi, two key nationalist figures, left Piedmont, soon to be followed by Giberti, who, anxious to pu publish his proposals for a federation of Italian states presided over by the Pope, left for the liberal city of Brussels. Another figure, Count Cavour, also left Piedmont, which he dubbed that intellectual hell, preferring the greater freedom of expression found almost anywhere else, even in Austrian Lombardy. On the other hand, some of Charles Albert's actions were those of a reformer. He made helpful changes in trade laws, reducing duties on imported goods, and signing trade treaties with other states. He tidied up the legal system and its laws. He allowed non-nobles to fill senior posts in the army and the Royal Advisory Council. Most important of all, in 1848 and 49, he granted his people a constitution which would survive to become the Constitution of the United Italy of the 1860s. Historians have tried to explain why Charles Albert changed from a liberal to a reactionary and back to being a liberal again, but have not found a satisfactory answer. Truly he was, as some contemporaries dubbed him, the wobbling king. One suggestion is that he had always been a nationalist, perhaps even a secret revolutionary, and once king was only waiting for a suitable opportunity to declare himself. Italy will make herself by herself, he famously insisted in the 1840s. Perhaps this was his wish all along, yet this interpretation is not very convincing since several of his actions after 1831 for instance, his alliance with Austria were reactionary. Part of the answer must lie in Charles Albert's own complicated character. Many described him as secretive and unsociable, seldom showing any emotion, and some have believed him out of touch with reality. His attraction to the more mystical aspects of Catholicism and his habit of wearing a hair shirt, which is a garment made of hair cloth causing discomfort, 
are not necessarily signs of mental imbalance, but his belief that he was cut out to be a soldier and a leader of men was at best unrealistic. Admittedly, he could be energetic and enterprising on occasions, but he lacked sustained determination as well as high-level abilities. Yet Charles Albert took to heart the idea of himself as a military leader, and he even came to believe with disastrous results that he was the military genius who could destroy the Austrian hold on Lombardy and Venetia. To fully understand Charles Albert's actions, we also need to be aware of the challenging circumstances in which his policies were made. Liberal influences were growing so that from 1841, for instance, non-political gatherings such as scientific conferences were allowed for the first time. Although seemingly non-political, such meetings often helped to spread liberal and nationalist ideas. At one such Congress held in 1846, Charles Albert was referred to as the Italian leader who would drive out the foreigners, an idea which gave the king immense satisfaction. As the 1840s wore on, the pressure for liberal reforms grew. In Turin, there were peaceful demands for a constitution from a small but well-educated and outspoken middle and professional social classes. In Genoa, still smarting from the loss of its independence and where Mazzini was a major influence, demands were more violent and revolutionary. The unrest in Turin spread, culminating in October 1847 in noisy demonstrations and threats of revolution, which persuaded Charles Albert to agree to reforms and to grant a constitution earlier in the following year. As a devout Catholic, he was probably influenced by the limited reforms recently introduced in the Papal States by Pius IX in his liberal face. Charles Albert's general reforms were aimed at taking some of the power away from the monarchy and putting it in the hands of government officials. For instance, the police were in the future to be under the control of the Minister of the Interior. Local government was also reorganized and local councils were elected. The constitution that the king had promised was issued in February of 1848 and was known as the Statuto. There was a stress on representative government and it must have cheered the reformers, but the articles were not very clearly expressed. Perhaps this was intentional as a way for Charles Albert to avoid giving too much of his power away. The full Statuto was published in March of 1848 and included a number of other clauses relating to legal equality for all, whatever their religion, and for equal employment opportunities. It did not lay down who would elect members of the lower chamber. This was fixed later when the vote was given to men who could read and write and who paid taxes. In fact, only about 2% of the population of Piedmont. The Constitution was not a parliamentary one, except in a very limited way, since it allowed the king to keep most of his existing rights. Nevertheless, it was undoubtedly a major advance. Many of Charles Albert's ministers thought it too extreme and so resigned, being replaced by more liberal-minded men. Meanwhile, events outside of Piedmont were moving rapidly and may well have influenced Charles Albert's decision to proclaim the Constitution. Revolutions in Sicily, Naples, Lombardy, and Venetia broke out in rapid succession between January and March of 1848. In Austrian Lombardy, Piedmont's eastern neighbor, extreme revolutionaries wanted an independent republic while more moderate ones wanted a union with Piedmont. Charles Albert saw advantages in putting himself at the head of the Lombard revolt against Austria, as eventually Piedmont might be able to dominate or even annex Lombardy. Typically, though, he hesitated, undecided whether to take military action or not, afraid that his absence might allow his own revolutionaries to stir up trouble in Genoa, the part of Piedmont most likely to organize a revolution. 
Eventually, public pressure and news that the revolutionary government now established in Venetia had voted for union with Piedmont persuaded Charles Albert to declare war on Austria in March of 1848. Again, historians have argued about Charles Albert's motives. Did he act out of self-interest in the expectation of Lombardy and Venetia being fused with Piedmont as the price of his help, thus merely clothing essentially imperialistic aims with appropriately nationalistic language? Or was he generally concerned to support a revolt against the foreigner Austria and make himself leader of a national independence movement? The decision to act finally made Charles Albert entered the war with enthusiasm. His army of 60,000 men, incompetently led by himself and ill-prepared for war, crossed into Lombardy and occupied the capital of Milan. The Austrians, who had already evacuated the city, brought up reinforcements and defeated Charles Albert at Catuza on the border with Venetia. The king had no choice but to ask for an armistice. This allowed the Piedmontese army to withdraw from Lombardy, leaving it again in Austrian hands. Charles Albert broke the news to his people in a carefully edited version of events. The want of provisions forced us to abandon the positions we had conquered, for even the strength of the brave soldier had its limits, but the throbs of my heart were ever for Italian independence. Show yourself strong in a first misfortune. Have confidence in your king. The cause of Italian independence is not yet lost. Early in 1849, having regrouped his forces and been persuaded incorrectly by his chief minister that Louis Napoleon, the newly elected president of the French Republic, would come to his aid if Piedmont again attacked Austria, Charles Albert re-entered the war, but with very little success as before. He was heavily defeated by the Austrians at Novara and then abdicated in favor of his son, Victor Emmanuel II. The king's unsuccessful attempt to defeat Austria in battle was a major blow for Italian nationalists. Clearly, while Austria remained so powerful, there was no way in which Italy could gain independence or unity without outside help. Yet, at least this blunt fact was now obvious, and future Italian leaders could learn this lesson. Charles Albert's other main legacy was the Statuto, which outlived him, the one tangible result in Italy of the revolutions of 1848. Victor Emmanuel II, who succeeded his father in March of 1849, has traditionally been seen as a courageous figure defying Austria's plans for the Statuto's abolition. Yet most historians now think that Victor Emmanuel was not particularly anxious to keep the constitution, but was pressured into doing so by the Austrians themselves, who feared that if he got rid of it, he would become so unpopular that not only he, but the monarchy itself would be threatened. In Austria's eyes, anything, even a state with a moderately liberal constitution, was better than a republic. The constitution therefore remained in force and in spite of its limitation, gave an opportunity for an active political life in Piedmont, something that did not then exist anywhere else in Italy. With a reasonably free press, an elected, if unrepresentative assembly, and a certain amount of civil liberty and legal equality, Piedmont attracted refugees from the rest of Italy during the next decade. This was to be a period dominated by the political leadership of Count Cavour, the military successes of Garibaldi, and the interventions of Napoleon III of France.